What's up, AP Psych? Welcome back. We are now moving on to Unit 7, which is our topic on cognition. And this is video number one, um, which is our Unit 7 will be our halfway point of the year in terms of content. And this unit is all about, like I said, cognition, the way we think, and anything that goes on with that outside of learning. Um, so we're really going to focus on memory for the first part. Um, and for today, we'll be focusing on introduction to memory and the process that we go through um, to create and store and retrieve memories and how that works with encoding. So that's where we're going to start. So basic intros. Memory. Memory is the basis of knowing your friends, your neighbors, the English language, the national anthem, and yourself. Right? It's the basis for us as human beings. If there was no memory, everyone would be a stranger to you. Every language would be foreign. Every task would be new. And even you yourself would be a stranger. So it's extremely important. It's a vital part of our lives and every day. Uh, memory is an indication that learning has persisted over time. It is our ability to store and retrieve information. Last unit, you know, we focused on behavioral learning and how that's a relatively permanent change in your behavior. Well, now this is getting into cognitive learning, which is a relatively permanent change in your thinking or thought processes, right? And that's what memory really is. It shows that learning has persisted over time and there's been a change that has occurred in our knowledge. So there's a couple types of memory. We'll start with one. Um, flashball memory is a, a unique and highly emotional moment, um, which can give rise to a clear, strong, and persistent memory called flashball. This memory is not free from errors. So oftentimes when we form emotional memories, um, they can be prone to different error issues and things that we'll talk about later on when we get to why we forget certain things or how reliable our memories are. But one of the big flashbulb moments in uh, my generation was the 9-11 attacks, right? Everyone kind of remembers like a snapshot in time uh, where they were, like I was in fifth grade at the time, sitting in fifth grade class um, when the teacher told us what was going on. Um, everyone kind of remembers that, and that's your flashball. Like you take a snapshot, um, and all the details seem very clear because it's such a strong emotional memory. There are various different stages of memory um, in order for us to process these. And in order to do this, I want you to kind of relate it to like a computer, right? So you can think of our brain as the computer system or the hard drive. Um, and when we're encoding or taking in information, that's like the keyboard typing in to the computer, right? You're adding information, you're taking it in, you're encoding it. Um, and there it's stored. And you can store it on a flash drive or on the computer hard drive or something like that. So we take in information, then we need to store it. And when it comes time to access that information, we retrieve it, we pull it up on the monitor, right? So those are the three stages of memory. We encode, we store, and we retrieve. We will also talk about why we forget certain things as well. So a theory of um, information processing and of memory creation and storage was from Atkinson and Schriffen. They created this three-stage model of memory, and they said our memory includes a sensory memory, a short-term memory, and a long-term memory. We have these three places that memories can stop along the way to making it to long-term, um, and there's processes and things that need to occur to get them from sensory memory to long-term memory. And we'll talk about each one individually and how they work together. First up is sensory memory. It's the initial momentary storage of information. It can last an instant, maybe a second or two. Okay? So this is when we use our senses to take in information. It allows us to take in all this info and decide if it's important enough for us to use um, or to pay attention to. If it's not, um, if it's not passed on from sensory to short term, it's lost, right? And we call that dis decay or displacement. These memories are displaced very quickly because we're always determining what's important. Do I need, even need to remember that? No? Okay, on to the next thing. So you can think of sensory memory like a snapshot, um, but a snapshot that is constantly replaced with new snapshots unless it's paid attention to and transferred to short-term memory. Right? We are always being bombarded with new sensations and things like that, and our brain has to determine what's important to remember and what's not. And that's what the job of sensory memory is. As we move along the process from sensory, if it's deemed important, it can be transferred into our short-term memory. So this holds meaningful info for a short period of time, 
usually less than 30 seconds, although you could potentially stretch it up to one minute. Um, it has a limited capacity of seven plus or minus two items. And we'll do some activities in class to demonstrate this. I know we've talked about it before, uh, but you have, so your short-term memory generally has a capacity of five to nine things at a time. That's all it can hold. Um, you can store more information if it is chunked or grouped together. So here's an example. I'll give you 10 seconds to try to memorize all these letters, right? Pause it, try it, right? You're probably gonna struggle, right? However, what if I chunk it like this for you? Right. And now all of a sudden, oh, I can remember PBS, Fox, CNN, ABC, CBS, MTV, NBC, because you recognize those things as meaningful to you and you've chunked them into smaller groups. So instead of 21 letters here, you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven groups of letters, which fits perfectly into our capacity of short-term memory. So being able to chunk things together can also help with um, improving and increasing the size of our short-term memory. Info will leave short-term memory if it's not rehearsed, right? or repetition of information is extremely important to transition uh, that information from short-term to long-term memory. So think about when you have to uh, remember a phone number, a new phone number, you have to keep repeating it to yourself until you dial that phone number. And if you don't keep repeating it, you'll forget, right? You get a new phone number and you just keep saying those nine letter, those nine numbers over and over and over again, right? Uh, to try to keep it in your, in your brain. Um, rehearsal will keep it in there and it's necessary if we hope it to be transferred to long-term memory. So short-term memory is limited by time and by the amount of things we need. If we wanna transfer it into our unlimited long-term, we have to rehearse, we have to chunk it, we have to keep coming back to it. So this is important for your studying habits as well, right? If you just take something in once, it's probably not gonna be transferred to long-term. You need to rehearse and go back over that information over and over and over again. Once it gets to long-term memory, um, that's memory that stores information on a relatively permanent basis. So there are some things that we may forget over time, but our long-term memory appears to have a limitless capacity and we can keep things there for essentially forever. Um, info in long-term memory is filed and coded so we can retrieve it when we need it. And it'll pop up when you need it. You can go back in your brain and find what you need when you're asked about that information. So there are a few problems with this model. Um, some information we know skips the first two stages of sensory and short-term memory and is kicked directly into our long-term. Um, since we cannot focus on all sensory information in the environment, we select important in information through our attention. That is important to us. So this is known as selective attention. It's a, it would be impossible for us to take in and process um, all of the sensory information coming in. So we focus our attention on certain things. Um, and so that is a drawback to our sensory memory, right? When you're watching TV or doing your homework and your mom says, hey, don't forget to wash the dishes. And she asks you 20 minutes later, why haven't you washed the dishes yet? And you're like, I didn't, you didn't even, you never asked me. And you get into this argument, right? That's due to selective attention because your sensory memory did not take in all of those potential senses around it. Then the nature of short-term memory is a little bit more complex, which we're going to get in, get into here in a second. It's not just this place where you have memory sitting there for a short amount of time. You can do things with them. So that was why Alan Badley expanded upon short-term memory with a concept known as working memory. And he proposes that working memory acts as an active workspace in which information is retrieved and manipulated and maintained through rehearsal. Instead of a simpler short-term memory that we described earlier, we have this capacity known as working memory. It's like our central executive. Um, it can contain auditory and visual processing to allow us to make decisions and reason through certain things. And it can allow us to briefly maintain information in an active state so we can do something with that information. So it's not just this short-term um, memory that we need to rehearse and rehearse and rehearse to get it to our long-term. We can hold information in our short-term slash working memory for 30 seconds to a minute so that we can do calculations, we can make decisions, we can do these things, and then we can let it go. So that's the idea of your working memory. It allows you to work with information and things you need to remember for a short amount of time 
so that you can get the things done in a day that you need to do. If slash when the info is not used, then it's lost. So now we come to encoding and how we get information into our brains, how we actually encode things and how we remember it, right? So those are some memory theories we just had there. How do we get that memory to stick? How does it get in? So some information like your route to school is gonna be automatically processed, right? You're gonna pick up that, pick up on that. And you're not really gonna try, it's just gonna happen. That's known as automatic processing. However, some novel information like a new cell phone number or a friend's new name or someone that you're meeting requires some attention and effort. And that we call effortful processing. So we're gonna talk about those two types of processing to figure out how we encode information. Automatic processing, um, it's an enormous amount of information is processed effortlessly, right? We don't even have to think about it. So some examples, we, eff or we automatically process space. We notice the spacing or placement of objects in our worlds. For example, while you're reading a textbook, you automatically encode the place of a picture on the page. You know where it is, you don't have to think about it. Um, you know how far away things are from you, right? You're automatically encoding the space around you. Time, we unintentionally note when the events take place in our day. If I asked you, hey, when, when did you eat lunch? Or, you know, when did you uh, get up for school? Right, you just have these things that you remember. Right? You say, oh, I eat lunch around noon, about midday. You know, I got up for school about six o'clock. You just automatically kind of encode these things because they're part of your day and it always happens. Automatic process through it. And you can also automatically process um, frequency. You effortlessly keep track of how often things happen to you or how often you do things. Right? One great example would be when you're at home on a Friday night or something and you're eating pizza and all of a sudden you finish, like, oh, I'm kind of full. That was six pieces. You're thinking, wow, I didn't, I didn't like keep track of those pieces. I just kind of knew I was automatically processing that information, that frequency of that event. So it's difficult to turn this off because we don't notice the fact that we are doing these, these things. They just happen automatically and they encode into our brain that way. On the other hand, you have effortful processing. This is novel information can only be committed to memory um, through effort like learning a concept from a text right? or writing down your notes right now, right? Or in school, when you're trying to learn a new concept, you have to effortly try to get it into your brain, right? Such processing can lead to durable and accessible memories. Um, this is the perfect example of practice makes perfect, right? It rings very true when it comes to memory. The more rehearsal you do, the more practice you do, the more meaningful that you make information, the more effort you put into learning it, the more successful you will be in keeping it in your memory. So that's important when you think about class and school, right? The more effort you put into things, the more likely you are to remember it. And that's a perfect example of something we talked about in the past of growth mindset as well. So some memory effects that will impact um, how we encode. There's something called the next in line effect. When your recall is better, for what other people say, but poor for a person just before you in line. So what does that mean? Think about back to like second or third grade, right? Or even in high school, if this happens. Um, think about when you have to read aloud in class. You're worried about what you have to read and aren't paying attention to what the person before you said. So the person five people ahead, you might remember what they read, follow along, but as it gets closer and closer to you, you're like, oh, you're kind of panicking. You're like, I need to practice mine. I'm not going to listen to anything anyone else says because I want to be prepared for me. That's the next in line effect. So we fail to encode the things that come right before us and what we need to do. There's also the spacing effect. We retain information better when our rehearsal is distributed over time. We've talked about this a lot for our studying in school. Studies have shown that if you study a bit each night, you will remember information better than if you cram the night before a test. We've called that distributed practice or chunking, right? You put it across an entire week instead of the night before. It's much more likely to stay in your long-term memory. If you cram, it's gonna be in that short-term, long-term area, and then it's gonna disappear after the test because you haven't given it any meaning, you haven't done enough rehearsal. Um, so distributed practice and spacing effect is greatly beneficial for our studying. And then we have something called serial position effect. Um, when your recall is better for first and last items, 
but poor for middle items on a list. This, you may also see this as the primacy or recency effect. I would write that down. So if I were to ask you to list the 44 presidents of the United States, many of you would probably do well with the first two or three presidents and the most recent two or three presidents, but you'd struggle with some of those random names in between like Millard Fillmore and uh, people like that. James K. Polk, like you might not even remember learning about them, right? Because that's the serial position effect. The first and last or primacy and recency effect um, impacts how we encode information. Another aspect of encoding, visual encoding is very, very beneficial for us. So mental pictures are a powerful aid to effortful processing, especially when combined with semantic encoding. So semantic is just the meaning and the actual information behind terms um, and things you're trying to learn. When you combine that with visual encoding or mental pictures, it will help things stay in your long-term memory and be much more meaningful to you. So for example, um, if I were just to tell you about the difference, the semantic part of what a normal lung looks like compared to one with smokers, dis, uh, emphysema, lung cancer, and bronchitis, you'd say, okay, I kind of get it. But when I add these pictures for you, of what a healthy lung looks like compared with a smoker's lung, emphysema, lung cancer, right? You start to realize and see, oh, now I understand the actual visual impact of what's behind this semantic meaning of these things. And it makes it stick that much better. All right. So a couple other things we can do to help improve our memory. Um, using imagery, we just talked about how powerful visual encoding is. Imagery is at the heart of many memory aids. Mnemonic techniques that use vivid imagery in aiding memory, method of loci, and peg word, and then we'll finally talk about chunking. So method of loci, um, it involves imagining that you're moving through a familiar series of locations with items that need to be remembered. So let's say you need to bring all these things to AP Psych class, a textbook, paper clips, note cards, colored pencils, scissors, and a computer. How do you remember all those things? So you might associate them with places in your house. So this is method of loci, so you'd say, I'm going to store my, um, at, when I get up in the morning, in order to remember this list of things I need to bring to school with me, I'm going to associate them with each room I move through as I get ready for school. So you'll say, I'll keep my textbook in my bedroom, paper clips in the bathroom, note cards in the living room, colored pencils in the kitchen, scissors in the garage, and the computer on the front porch. So when you wake up in the bedroom and you're thinking, all right, let me travel through my house here to remember all these things. And you can visualize and you can say, I'm in the bedroom, I need my textbook, go to the bathroom to brush your teeth, I gotta get my paper clips. Um, and it's just a way of remembering the, your list of items by visualizing a familiar place and moving through it in your mind to remember what you need. Next up is peg word. Um, first, in order to use a peg word, you have to memorize a simple jingle such as one is bun, two is shoe, three is tree, four is door. Oftentimes, people who use peg word use letters and something that rhymes with it, just like this. And you try to associate that with a list of things you're trying to remember. Even better, if you can visualize items you're trying to remember. So, you put the jingle together with your list. One is bun, and then you visualize putting, oh, I need, okay, my grocery list, I need lettuce. I put lettuce on the buns. One is bun, lettuce. Two is shoe. I envision a banana sticking out of the shoe. Two is shoe, banana. Three is tree. I imagine some cheese up in the tree, right? And four is door. And I imagine throwing a tomato at the door. And that'll help me remember my list. I know some of these kind of sound funky and a little bit weird, but some of the world's greatest memory challenge experts use peg word and method of loci to memorize lists that are thousands of digits or words long. So this visualization technique can be extremely powerful in terms of memory. And finally, we have chunking, organizing items into familiar, manageable units. Okay? The best way or one of the great ways that we use to do this is through acronyms, taking the first letter of, of a list of items or phrases by creating a new word, phrase, or sentence. So some common ones, remembering the Great Lakes with homes, remembering the order of operations with PEMDAS, the colors of the rainbow with Roy G. Biv. But in psych, we've already learned some. Sodas, 
for our FRQs, right? Space, order, define, apply, synonym to remember the process of FRQ writing. Bats drink blood to remember the different brain waves at each stage of sleep. And we have more to come for those as well. And we'll get into another one, this unit, which will be very helpful in you remembering a concept. So that's another great way to help encode things into our brain. So that was a lot of information. I encourage you to go back, rehearse it, write it down um, so that you can transfer this information from short term slash working memory into your long term and make it stick. Let me know if you need anything. Have a great day.